qualitative research and the future of mental health care. Talking about the future is not so easy. And as a German author, Kurt Tucholsky, once remarked, prognoses are extremely difficult, particularly when they concern the future. So the question is how we get there um, into our speculation. One way for doing it is to look at the past. If we know where we come from, we may be in a better position to think about where we might be going. Now, um, I, I will simplify the history enormously and be very brief, but still a few key points about where mental health care has been coming from. There has been care for mentally ill people for centuries, but not in the modern way um, and in line with modern psychiatry or modern ways of understanding mental health care. So this is what we had in the 18th century, the hospital for lunatics, the incurables, and in a more artistic way, this is um, Rake's Progress, a wonderful painting series of Hogarth, of a man who did everything that you shouldn't have been doing in the 18th century in, uh, in England. So he was womanizing and drinking and gambling. And so he ended up in the Bethlehem Hospital, as you can see here with shackles in the forefront. And every now and then, ladies of the better society came around to be amused by the mentally ill. That was um, the way mentally ill people were, were kept by us and the treatment. Here was a Thomas Monroe, um, the, the head of the, of the bad lamb, was asked by, the, by, the, by a committee of the House of Commons, when the medicine is administered, is it varied according to the circumstances of the patients, or is any general remedy applied? And the answer was, we apply generally bleeding, perching and vomit. Those are the general remedies we apply. So it was a very, pretty bleak picture, but then something happened, not within medicine, not within psychiatry, but elsewhere in society, the French Revolution. And with the French Revolution, um, the overall development of the Enlightenment and the values of liberté, égalité, fraternité, that either directly like in France or indirectly like in other countries, changed um, the whole fabric of our societies. And very briefly afterwards, here in, in France, Pinel was, he didn't do it personally, but was seen to remove the shackles of, the, um, of psychiatric patients and um, provide some liberty and freedom. And this was arguably the first institution of modern mental health care, the retreat in York. And what they had in common, here, Pinel and, and the Dukes um, for the York retreat was humanitarian treatment where the shackles were removed, patients were treated with dignity and minimal restraint. The treatment consisted of humanity, reason and kindness with a staff patient ratio of one to three, something that most institutions today can only dream of, and a focus on conversations and behavior in groups. So a fundamental change, and as you can see, no research, no academic psychiatry in the modern, in the modern sense influences. It was values, it was societal changes. And within only 50 years, this Bedlam Hospital allegedly turned into this. This was a male ward, certainly a bit embellished, but yeah, these are pictures of the time. And this was the occupational um, therapy for, for women. So the, the asylums were changed into institutions that were meant to be therapeutic, were usually in green, um, leafy environments, and were generously equipped. Nevertheless, they very soon became um, increasingly overcrowded. Very soon, there were four or five times as many patients in it than they had been constructed for. So conditions were poor. There was a risk of starving during the First World War on both sides of the front. Um, patients in asylum were starving to death and people were rarely discharged at all. And this is a picture of an asylum in Ohio State. So that's what it looked like um, after a while. Nevertheless, and now is where research comes into it, not in our sense of today, but still in terms of academic work at the time. 
This is Willem Griesinger, the first professor of psychiatry at the Charité in Berlin, who already published extensively about the need to move um, care into the community to overcome old fashioned um, hospital um, settings, and that was in the 1860s. So the reforms began with ideas since the 1860s. This is important to consider because it shows that psychiatrists and other academics publish these ideas throughout, but whether they whether they materialized and were put into practice, that depended on other things in society. There were concrete initiatives from the 1920s onwards, the first home treatment team in the 1930s, and from 1940s onwards, a reduction of beds. This is important, that was in the 40s, because you will sometimes read that the reduction of beds was initiated by the discovery of antipsychotics, this is evidently, evidently not true because it started earlier, but the um, discovery of psychotropic drugs, first antipsychotics, then antidepressants and mood stabilizers may have given the whole initiative a psychological boost so that psychiatrists and other professionals felt more confident, more encouraged to, to achieve change to have something at their disposal to treat patients and so also to reform care. And the psychological treatments were introduced more or less at the same time, um, apart from psychoanalysis, which was, was much older and arguably behavior therapy, but all the other approaches, family therapy, cognitive therapy, um, client-centered therapy, systemic approaches, um, everything um, originated roughly in the 1950s and 1960s. And then something else happened. Four books were published. Four books of authors who, as far as we know, did not know of each other. So independently, they were published within only 15 months. And when it was in these 15 months, there was Michel Foucault with Madness and Civilization. So the idea that um, so we, uh, psychiatry is a way to medicalize uh, abnormality. Um, Ronald Lang, who felt that psychotic behavior and psychotic experience is understandable based on the biography of people. Thomas Sath, who as an, as an Hungarian Jew who survived the, the Holocaust, felt that liberty is much more important than treatment and argued heavily against um, uh, compulsory treatment. All ideas that are still um, very valid today. And the fourth book was actually a qualitative research, arguably the most influential piece of research in the history of psychiatry. Irvin Goffman's Asylum and the idea of total institutions, uh, the rules of which determine the behavior of everyone, staff and patients and everyone else. And so the reforms happened not at the same time, but here only three examples, the hospital plan in England and Wales, the um, uh, psychiatry enquete in Germany in 1975, and the law 180 in Italy um, in, in 1978. So what happened then through and since reforms, across, at least across Europe, across most of the Western world, asylums were closed or significantly downsized and changed. Instead, we had smaller inpatient departments at general hospitals. We have more staff for many, many more patients. We have got better qualified staff. I'm not so sure about better qualification of psychiatrists, but I think other professional groups are certainly better qualified than they used to be. And we have got much better facilities. Why? We've got a widening of healthcare in general. The amount of money that all Western society spent on healthcare has been increasing, increasing, increasing. Beyond that, we have got more public attention to problems of mental disorders. We have got a different and arguably more positive attitude to mental health in society. And money counts. We have got overall much more investment. So what has research um, contributed to this? I will come to the to qualitative research more specifically a bit later, but let's let's put all research into one basket. 
what has research uh, contributed? So we have got billions of investment in mental health research worldwide. People always complain about the lack of funding, but I think that's ridiculous. There's enormous amounts of money are spent on that. The older ones amongst you may even remember the decade of the brain in the 1990s when there was a declaration that, okay, let's invest a bit of money and then we sort it. We will just look properly into psychosis and other disorders and we will sort it. We have got thousands of academic careers, my own included. We've got even more research studies and I don't know, the publication may go into hundreds of thousands. And what did it produce in the last 50 years? We have not a single new and more effective drug than was available in 1970. Let's leave side effects away uh, aside for, for a moment, but in terms of effectiveness, zero progress. We have hardly any new psychotherapeutic school I would even argue that psychological treatments have made one or st two steps backwards, but that's a different discussion. And not only pointing the finger at others as a social psychiatrist, I have to admit, we have got hardly any new social intervention either. We have no completely new service types. Um, day hospitals exist since the 1920s, community mental health teams, sort of outreach, everything had already been there. Not everywhere, but it did exist. Worse, we've got very limited effect sizes. So um, let's take one of the, um, of the flagships of um, our, our treatment, acute treatment with antipsychotic medication, according to the review of Leucht. It has a um, number needed to treat of six. That means you need to treat six people in order to have the desired effect on one. Now that's of course nothing we tell our patients. We don't say, oh, there are six acutely admitted of you, we treat all of you, and one of you, bingo, will have an effect for the other five, I will feel very sorry. We don't say that. And we call it effective, although at best we have a probability to help. Now, whenever I present this, people say, rightly, that um, effect sizes um, and number needed to treat in other areas of medicine are not much better. That is true, but it doesn't help our patients. And if the effect sizes are, are not good, we have hardly any predictor for individual treatment response. I sometimes read these days papers about, oh, now we go to patient-centered uh, treatment and uh, that we will uh, individualize treatment. Um, when I started 45 years ago, um, the language was absolutely the same, but nothing happened. We have no idea to say, okay, you will be better for psychoanalysis, but it's, well, it's for you, it's better to take um, behavior therapy or for you the green pill, for you rather the pink one, absolutely nothing. So what can we conclude from the past before I will move to the future? Major progress was driven and shaped by societal change and progress came with controversy even the reforms of the, yeah, with hindsight, horrible um, asylums after the Second World War came with controversy. Not all professionals were in favor of that, far from it. But they, they happened whenever professionals in mental health linked with other parts in society at large. So then we, we uh, managed to change things. We can conclude that substantial change is not frequent, but it is possible. However, the time and direction of such changes are very difficult to predict. Now let's go into the future. And for the future, I don't mean the next five years, at least a generation, let's say the next 30 to 50 years. Some things are probably um, straightforward to predict. We will have a further growth of mental health care. It is a growing business. In 30 years, there will be more patients and more people and a wider coverage. At the same time, our current in and outpatient services have been pretty robust and stubbornly there. So although there's not a single study in the whole world showing that inpatient care is effective or more effective than alternatives, hospital beds are there, 
and they will probably stay at least for 30 to 50 years. Also, current treatments will probably still be in use. I would think that we will stop prescribing antipsychotics, at least routinely in the current doses, but they will still be there. But what's the impact of research? Now, more in basic sciences will provide more insights. We will know more about transmitters and cells and what happens in the brain. And everything that's technology driven, um, that uses data that we can um, assess either through new uh, neuroimaging, through um, analyzing data of mobiles and, um, and social networks, all that will improve. However, I would think that the conventional concepts of diseases and the current psychological con constructs may limit, may limit the progress. What do I mean with that? And since I don't want to be just negative, I will be very, very short. The disease idea that depression is, a, is something that um, is equivalent to a tumor um, is very questionable. And I think um, bound to get stuck. I think that all this research will never produce anything. And the same applies to psychological constructs. Um, the problem with them is that in psychological research, they are very often taken as entities. So for instance, you can um, analyze statistically how quality of life and depression and empowerment interact, which is of course total nonsense because neither quality of life, nor depression, nor empowerment are entities that, that could act, let alone interact. All these quality of life, depression, empowerment are all our constructs to explain what patients tick on questionnaires or how they behave. They are nothing that exists as an entity that could be removed or changed or could drive and become active. I will stop here but move on to why I think there is some hope for and through qualitative research. Qualitative research has at least the potential to be not to be confined by existing concepts. It could get um, beyond that. It can use, um, it doesn't need to measure quality of life um, according to some definition. It can develop new ideas and concepts. It can be methodologically flexible. Um, I'm a bit concerned that in the publication business that is something that's being lost. It's too much of, uh, oh no, 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 this is not uh, thematic uh, analysis as defined by whoever in the paper 2011, you should have done this and this and that, and this is not correct, or this is not grounded theory, and uh, you would have to do that and, and something else but still it could be more methodologically flexible than any quantitative research. It can be open towards new developments and therefore it has a potential to drive innovation, particularly as it is, again, potentially capable of capturing societal movements. And as I said earlier, social and societal movements are um, essential to understand why psychiatry and how psychiatry and mental health care can change. Now, let's go to the future directly. And again, I will not talk about the next five years. It is about the next 30 or let's say 50 years. And instead of speculating of what will be there and what is the most probable prognosis, I will use a different concepts. And that's a concept and the methodology, a qualitative methodology um, of scenario plan planning. So you don't ask what is likely to be there in 30 to 50 years. You just say what different scenarios in themselves coherent and clear are conceivable. These scenarios are not mutually exclusive. They're developed in several steps. Um, normally it starts with a survey, on current uncertainties and on drivers. Then we did here art inspired multidisciplinary workshops of two days in galleries where whenever people got stuck, there was um, the possibility to um, get inspired again and new ideas that 
um, go beyond the, the usual horizon. Then in those workshops, you develop preliminary scenarios that are then further developed and detailed and shaped um, um, later in conceptual work. And what I present now is the um, synthesis of at least two of these um, um, scenario planning um, studies, um, both published, but, but uh, what is here now is, is basically a new, a new synthesis. I don't go into the uncertainties, but just some drivers that are relevant for society and will be relevant for mental health care. There's globalization, there's climate change, there's demo demographic change, with at least in, in Europe, people getting much older and some, um, uh, some societies uh, heavily shrinking. There's migration, which is, I mean, can only go into one direction. Of course, it will increase further. There's a social isolation that is increasing despite our living in large urban um, environments. There's a social inequality. Almost everyone, or not everyone, but most um, sociologists and even politicians would, would agree that there's too much social inequality, but it's still increasing. So privatization. There's technolog technological pro progress who, yeah, uh, let's say uh, 13 years ago, would have thought that we don't need maps anymore, that we can just look at, at the app. Um, the first app, I think, was came to the market 2008-9. Uh, look at an app and it tells us where we are, where we, where we can go, how long it will take, and, and absolutely everything. Pandemics, populism, all these things may drive where we'll be going. And I will present now five scenarios that, again, it's not about whether they are the most likely ones or whether they capture everything that is um, that can happen, but they should be in themselves coherent and, um, and a logical development from where we are. Scenario one, patients take over, the takeover. In this scenario, Services are controlled by patients and funded through personal budget so that patients have uh, control over their, over their budgets. Um, logically, there's no coercion. Um, health professionals are employed by patients and therefore behave and provide treatment as desired by patients. And um, yeah, they are being employed or at least utilized uh, by patients as they like. Scenario two, mental health is everything. It's not just that mental health is important. No, your mental health is absolutely everything. So all human misery, all human distress, uneasiness and unhappiness, yes, all discomfort are understood as mental health problems as we call it now. So you may have seen that, and I will go into that later, what you've seen recently. So this includes the large developments in societies, consequence of war and catastrophes, but as well as everyday problems. So you don't feel sad you, um, or, or, or in despair. Again, you're never in misery, you have a mental health problem. The term mental health will determine the public and private discourse and um, part political parties will include increasingly argue to improve the mental health of the population. So mental health is a political and a societal priority. Mental health care in this scenario optimizes the well-being and not just to reduce discomfort, but also to improve performances of all parts of the population. So if my son does not do very well in school, it's a mental health problem and um, there should be a mental health professional um, encouraging him and facilitating and supporting um, his performance. Professionals in the scenario are life and performance coaches and may also use performance enhancing drugs. Yes, there will be some professionals that still deal with patients with severe illnesses, but they will be mainly in the social and justice system. In the overall society, mental health professionals 
deal with absolutely everything that is right or that could or might be improved. Third scenario, the virtual mental health professional. So I don't know who of you is a clinician, but he is a virtual clinician, virtual professional, professional is available at any time, day and night, everywhere. Response within seconds, milliseconds. You don't need an appointment, no waiting time. The, the virtual professional knows all details of the person's history and never forgets anything you've ever said. The virtual professional knows the complete scientific literature, always up to date, including what was published an hour ago. The virtual professional communicates always exactly in the style that the patient likes, because the virtual professional learns from your response. And if you like short answers, long answers, whatever, the virtual professional will comply. And the virtual professional is never tired or in a bad mood or exhausted, always there. So whoever of you is clinician and myself, we cannot compete with that. So professional, virtual professional is guided by artificial intelligence, can even send drugs via drones or produced through a 3D printer, can possibly even either do or arrange home visits and crisis interventions through robots. Interestingly, when you think the scenario through, patients can take several identities and use several prof professionals at the same time. Human professionals here are largely redundant, but they can work in software development. Fourth scenario, partner of the poor and socially excluded. In this scenario, mental health care is a core service for socially excluded. Social exclusion can be through poverty, isolation, marginalization, discrimination, homelessness, exposure to violence and crime. And the aim is to limit social misery and to strengthen social capital. It reminds me, I think my last service visit before the pandemic was in San Remo in Italy, where they presented the, um, yeah, the famous um, um, Italian servants that, oh, 10 to 15 years ago, we cared mainly for patients with severe psychosis, which, yes, were mainly in poorer and more deprived social spheres, but not only. And nowadays, our, our clients are, are homeless, are illegal uh, migrants, uh, drug abusers, and um, socially marginalized. In this one, mental health care is mainly for people with persistent and physical disorders, isolated, not able to get a hold regular employment. Mental health care will have to link with basic general medical services and with social care. Social interventions and individual treatment are part of generic overall care. And professionals, mental health professionals that is, are here part of a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team. And the last one is data-driven mental health care. Here, we comprehensively collect all data on psychological and social variables. That is not just um, through surveys and um, uh, repeated and consistent assessments. There's also all data that we share on social media whenever the term I don't know, depressed or sad or, or um, sickness comes up. It's all documented somewhere, put together, interpreted and analyzed and linked to what is happening in society. So arguably you can spot um, new infections much, much earlier analyzing social, social networks than you would waiting for um, doctors to report the results of their assessments of patients. The data assessment is throughout communities, including schools, 
workplaces, and of course, all health services. It's through all online activities that you are watching this um, presentation is part of it. It will be documented and analyzed and interpreted as your potential interest in quality of research and the future of mental health care. All data will be consistently analyzed and used to inform um, decision makers and it will guide all actions of mental health care. What you will use the data for is to modify social and physical environment to reduce mental distress. So there is something in class B and was it um, 70 year olds, uh, year olds and that and that school. So you will look immediately as to what is going on with a, with a teacher or with some disruptive um, member of the class and can, can, in, uh, can intervene very, very quickly. You have to work with the community, not just do what many of our current community mental health service do that work in my view in the community, but not necessarily with the community. And we'll have to provide support for parents, influence working conditions, accommodation, and strengthen social networks. This will require a link with local authorities and other public services. Of course, all of these scenarios raise questions. Um, as I said, all scenarios probably have already started. Patients take over. See, um, you can, at least where I work, you can't um, employ uh, mental health professionals anymore without a patient being on the panel. Um, they are in all committees. Um, when I apply for a new research study, how good the application is is one issue, but um, did I include patients is at least as important. But if it is all that patients decide, where is the place for scientific evidence? Where's the place for what we were talking about, the development of modern mental health care as part of modernism and of um, including evidence? The so second one, if everything is mental health, if um, my being unhappy with COVID and all that is all a mental health problem, is that compatible with our values? Did those of you who, were, who are clinicians, did we join the profession in order to improve people's performance, in order to avoid that anyone feels discomfort at any point of time? Is that our view of humankind that there should be no misery at all? Or do we believe that whoever wants to laugh also has to cry at times? The virtual psychiatrist, it looks at the first glance as if this gives a, a lot of power to the consumer. You can use your virtual psychiatrist when and how you like, but who controls the software? Who's in charge of that? In partner of the poor, if we are as mental health care professionals, if we are part of a multidisciplinary team that mainly focuses on social in in initiatives, what specific expertise is left for us? Or when it is a data-driven mental health care? Yes, I can, like Big Brothers watching you, I can increasingly collect and analyze data. But if I know that something is going wrong in... I don't know, that road, if in that family, and then are there effective ways to intervene very quickly and prevent further distress or deterioration? What, 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 what shall I do? I mean, the whole problem of uh, prevention, we all, everyone would agree that prevention is better than cure, and we all talk, oh yeah, we should prevent, but how? So this is all the 50 year future, but we are living here in 2021. What do we do now in care and research? Let's first say in mental health care. Now, radical changes unlike are unlikely in the short term. However, for all scenarios, there are some signs already as I've tried to, to outline. Um, and I think the pandemic has underlined a few of them, and particularly the scenario that everything is mental health. 
um, there are not, there's not that much evidence that um, what, what we traditionally understand as mental disorders have increased. Suicide rates, for instance, have not increased. But still, everyone, it's a mental health problem. Uh, if people are alone at home because they can't, if, if, I don't know, if children can't uh, play with their, with, their, um, with their friends, they have a mental health problem. Everything um, is under that banner. The attitudes to these scenarios, they can vary. They depend on personal values and preferences. You are free to feel, oh yes, it should all be data-driven or the virtual mental health care professional is exactly the, the way we should be going. Um, all, um, all scenarios um, throw up questions about the role of professionals. What is the specific and distinct competence? What is our precise role? And also, increasingly important, given the shortage of um, most mental health professionals in most Western countries, um, what's the appeal? Who wants to do that job? So why that was mental health care, this is about quality of research. So what is the chance for, for research now? And I think what, what these scenarios show is that we should search for long-term gains. Um, most of our research studies are, are funded for three years or for five years. And then you have to, um, if it is that long, and then you have to spend much time on um, on um, uh, trying to find the next uh, the next grant. Um, I don't want to talk about the good old times, but hardly anyone can go for 20 year perspective. Uh, everything is on shorter and shorter cycles and the long-term gains, um, I think have to, have to feature more prominently. The so scenarios that I presented, maybe the others, can guide concepts. In any case, when I say that um, or claimed that um, I think for at least 50 years there has been no real progress. I mean, progress in mental health care and what we can actually do for patients. There's been not enormous progress. What we do, yes, because there's more money, but not what we can do. Um, then what follows from that is that we should, bo should be bolder and have more courage for innovation. That requires flexibility, new ideas, and high risk research. Now, that may or may not also require changes to the publication and funding system. Um, that may be something for the discussion or not. Um, I think the, the system that we live in in the academic world is incredibly rigid. It's self-centered. It is self-serving. Um, all this stuff about um, peer review, impact factors, the way academic careers are, um, are promoted, the, the dependence on, on fundings, all that is good for mainstream, for self-service, um, for feeling very important and um, for wasting money, um, but it's not good for research and for progress. And as I said earlier, I think there are chances for quality of research. Chances doesn't mean that, I, that my prognosis is that quality of research will change the world, but I think there are in all that our, chan our chances. And with that, welcome to the future. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for this uh, interesting presentation. And uh, now I invite uh, uh, the audience to, to ask questions. As I can see, Miss Clarissa Scary, I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> uh, for my pronunciation. Uh, do you want to ask something? I can see you have raised your hand. Um, actually, I was clapping. <laughs> <laughs> and you're sitting in front of a very nice background. <laughs> So maybe I, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Professor Prieber, to for your presentation. And I was wondering why, why listening to you um, about what your hypotheses are uh, the last 50 years. I mean, we, 
uh, that there is no, let's say, no real innovation. And I agree with you, there is a production of a lot of, <laughs> let's say, scientific material. But uh, from the point of view, as you describe in your innovation in terms of being um, part of a social change or um, um, actually, and I haven't seen this yet until now, uh, uh, it's true, it's not, not that much happened. And uh, what is your hypothesis? What is the the background of this, let's say, stagnation of ideas. Okay, um, I'm not an historian, so I'm a lay person on that. If I say there hasn't been, happened anything for 50 years, that also raises a question, why was there so much progress before that? So all current, all current drugs, all current psychotherapeutic schools, all social concepts were all developed more or less within 25 years after the Second World War. I don't have an answer to that, but um, the difference was that there was much more freedom for creativity. Um, someone like Maxwell Jones never wanted to become a psychiatrist, um, ended up there, uh, introduced um, therapeutic communities. Um, you couldn't do that today anymore. Um, both the research business, not just both, all three times. I think problems are the research business is very rigid. And um, I can explain, maybe I uh, elaborate a little bit because that's my, I, I play the game very well. Yeah, I've, I've raised, I, I, I'm not complaining as a, as a loser here, but still I think the, the game is total nonsense. Just one example. If the European Union now pulled, puts out a new call for a search area, a new treatment of whatever, then, 200, work, 200 groups across Europe will start working on the application. Although at the end, only three will get that. Maybe only one, but you know which three will be in the, in the mix, yeah, in the groups. That means 197 groups waste their time, public money, on working on something on which someone else is better anyway. Now, you would never create a system like that, yeah? On top of that, every strange idea that they may have had. They have to ignore because they have to, to work on that mainstream stuff that has made it through a call for the, for the European Union. Yeah. So peer review, take peer review as an example. Why should I, who am of the generation that, as I say, has not made any pre uh, breakthrough, why should I be the best person to judge the breakthrough of the future. If, if we had this peer review system, um, Einstein would never have been able to do the relativity, th relativity theory. So, uh, of course, someone, some reviewer would have said, come on, that's nonsense. Yeah, bang, out. Um, good, so that, that's the research business. It's a self-centered academic um, um, rat race that, um, I'm winding myself up here, but, but it is it, that, that I think is meant not to produce real, real progress. And you could see that the real progress now with the, uh, with the vaccination happened outside of it. Yeah, then yes. It's not because people are stupid. Good, that's a business. So concepts are already um, uh, touched on that. The neurobiological paradigm that the psychiatrists use, that's a real thing is in the brain. Yeah, the MRC, the Medical Research Council, they have in their motto that they want to find out how, how brain drives behavior. That's on the website. As if brain was a little man sitting there and steering what I should do. Yeah, all that, that's a real thing is in the brain rather than, and then that can be psychologically expressed and socially managed. Um, but, but at the same time, I think psychology is totally stuck with what I explained a bit more, with mistaking the, the constructs as, as real entities. Good. And then finally, we're into mental health care. Now, state-funded uh, care, like in Italy, like in, 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 in England, they have more the potential to, to reform. They overdo it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've been reorganized um, every time. Why is the system that's more privately organized, like the States or like in Germany, nothing happens for 25 years? 
Yeah, in, in Germany, there's a fantastic um, um, expertise um, um, a report that um, they have got too many hospital beds. They have got more nurses per patient per, per people than anyone else, but fewer per patient than anyone else because too many beds. So they should reduce a bed. Everyone agrees. It's, agrees. It is never going to happen for political reasons. So all these things are stuck, and to overcome that. Uh, would require for mental health care political will. For research business, I'm pretty despondent. I don't know whether it can get out of the current academic, um, academic system. Interestingly, um, universities with real money, like Harvard or Stanford, they can get out of that. Because if you have a good, a good idea there, you just go to the director, give them two pages, and you get a few million tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and what was the third one? And as a conceptual one, I hope there will be thinkers that produce now. I have got good trust in people, not, not in so, into social systems. Sorry, that was a very long answer. No, no, that's absolute. Thank you very much. I see that Erminia Colucci is uh, having a question. Yes. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. I wish we were meeting in, in uh, Malta for real, but nice to see you all. And Stefan. Um, just uh, thank you for your very insightful moment. Yes, I mean, I'm mean, thinking about the peer review process right now, and that's very good point you're making. Something I was thinking while you were presenting about the scenario, you were saying um, uh, about, you know, how little we have progressed, and I completely agree with you on that. But then also made me think about uh, in my research, as you know, in, in uh, different countries, in low income countries, low middle income countries like India, in Pakistan, in Indonesia, I do see some innovations that I think are very promising um, and, uh, and uh, that could potentially could also be useful learnings in also higher income country. And what is the issue that, as you know, I have is that a lot of what we see in mental health care, a lot of what we learn about, and I suspect in this conference will be the same, will be coming mainly from North Europe and North America. So then we are not exposed to actually what are some potential ideas coming from other contexts that are uh, also uh, partially applicable to our context. So it's a different kind of, I was, I'd like to think about, okay, how can we perhaps, what would be a way for us to actually be able to learn uh, in terms of also doing research and particular qualitative research that perhaps can help us to really understand what's going on in this, in this context uh, so that we can also learn from this unknown often or very little known uh, innovative approaches. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I mean, first of all, this is exactly what we are not doing in global, global health research. Everyone says that and pays lip service to it, but what happens is exactly the opposite. Um, um, as an example, I don't know, I was, I was invited to talk to the, uh, to the Ministry of Peru how to build up community care. I had to start with saying, I've never treated a patient in Peru. I've never run a service there. I've never done a study there. And I come from a country that struggles itself to do proper mental health care. Who am I to tell you what you should do here? But that's exactly what I'm supposed to do um, with, a, with a global health funding, number one. Number two is, if we want to look for them, I don't think we will find new treatments or, or services or so. We have to look at, uh, at whole societies and to, to look at how community uh, family structures, for instance, are more cohesive and support patients. It's not about, it's not, it's not about oh, that's a new technology that we haven't um, come across yet. It's about looking more holistically, and it's also easier said than done, but more holistically at the fabric and the social interactions um, um, which support these people who are in mental distress and different understandings of mental distress. Whether that's going to happen, I don't know. I think we are more, as I said, in, in danger of exporting McDonald's to everywhere and, um, and do, doing the same. I mean, we have just done or are in a mental health group um, where we said, look, we can't export our, our interventions. We have to use the, the um, resources that are already there. And when you do something like multifamily groups, good, the idea may have arisen somewhere, but it's a very, very general idea. You will find out that they are much, much more effective or helpful in, in Colombia or even in Bosnia than they are in England because they have got more to tap into. They have more to use. So I fully agree with you with, with that we should learn from 
other societies, but but should look beyond mental health care or technologies or specific treatments. Is mm -hmm. that an answer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, I believe, Fran, uh, someone putting his hand up. Fran, we are, yeah. Fran, Fran. Sorry, thank you very much. Association, yeah. No, no worries. Uh, regards to everybody from lovely Scotland, um, I just have one question from you. You mentioned quite a um, nice description of how the future mental health should be, but I'm really wondering what's your opinion with regards to diagnostic criteria? Do you believe that they should change as well? Because even now we have some uh, calls for replacing traditional DSM-5 and ICD-10 reliance and implement something which is called transdiagnostic approaches to diagnosis. So I'm wondering, what do you think uh, with regards to those kind of core diagnostic tools that basically can lead to treatment and also the research as well? Okay. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not an anti-psychiatrist. I think um, psychiatry and mental health care is not a total pseudoscience although it's not far from it. But all the diagnostic criteria are total pseudoscience. There's mm -hmm. no objective test, biologically or otherwise, for any category. It's the only interest to come up with these categories was originally the drug industry mm. that wanted to... Tr right. um, i g g give you an example. We published yeah, a trial on dialectic by behavior the therapy um, can you please mute yourselves when you're not? Yeah, thank okay. you. We published a trial on the uh, dialectical behavior therapy, very good trial, um, um, and there's just listed the diagnosis of people. And people had not on maximum, on average, eight XS1 diagnoses and 3.5 XS2 diagnoses. There was not a single reviewer. Not, not the editor, it was published very well. Not, no reader has sent back, look, what rubbish is that? Yeah, you have got one person, good. You can have an ear infection and broken legs that has nothing to do with each other. But you can't have, it's all one person, one biography, one social context. You can't have eight diagnoses. So the only interest in that, when you have got eight diagnoses, you may need eight specialists, eight treatments, yeah, and you, okay. so all that debate about diagnostic categories to me is a waste of time. They have to be useful. Yeah, is this really depression? There is no, depression is not real. The suffering is real, the distress is real, but the behavior is real. But depression is our construct. It's in us to explain what we see. And unless it helps us to deal with the problems better, it's la pour la. It's, it's a bit like, there was a small book that in, 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 influenced me a lot. I think it's called La Strega del Capitano by Shasha about how um, the witches were treated in, I think, Milano in the 17th century. And there was, yeah, yeah, people didn't believe in it fully, and but there was some evidence, like confessions and and all that. And you should, uh, how should you really diagnose witches? And so, until someone said, "Look, it's all nonsense," that was the only way to overcome it. So all these diagnostics, unless these diagnoses are useful to guide our behavior, which are currently not, there's not a single diagnosis specific uh, treatment. And then on top of that, to say, ah. We are transdiagnostic, clever of us. We go now beyond that. And then, so we take a total nonsense and put it now together. Yeah, I'm, I'm old enough to, to say these things, but um, in all this diagnostic uh, discussion, ICD 11 and 12 and 13, there's nothing in it. Sorry for this <laughs> radical. <laughs> Thank you. There is another question. We have five minutes left. Uh, Ashra Khanom, I can see. Uh -huh. yeah. um, hello. Thank you for a very thought provoking talk. And um, I, I've just got a quick question, basically. You probably answered it in your talk. But how do we deal with the opposing di dichotomies of, say, medical imbalance versus social causes? 
and then treatment versus um, so, uh, uh, medical treatment versus, versus um, uh, talking therapies. And where do you see the future going? Are we, is there amalgamation of this or is we moving away from this? Or what is your thoughts in terms of how do we um, prevent and treat um, mental health? Um, so I'm not talking about the really uh, psychosis and schizophrenia, but the general mental health that general population faces in terms of depression and bipolar. Um, sorry, um, lots of this borderline personality disorder and things like that. But people are put into, especially women. Um, what? How do you move in the future? And how do we as researchers take this forward? Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's a $1,000 question. Um, I try to show a few, few scenarios. I think in the short term, uh, mental health as a market will, will increase. There will be more and more, and it is probably uh, driven more by identity politics and um, not evidence and, um, and, and interest sold in a populist way, and people will pay money to get, um, to get whatever, whatever they want outside the severe mental illness. When it is more about um, practice, um, I don't recognize so the medical model and the social model. Maybe in my practice, I've never used that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the good, the good psychiatrist and psychologist mm -hmm. I've seen have always looked at the whole person in, with the whole biography in the whole um, um, context and um, used... I mean, I've prescribed medication. It's not, it's not that I'm totally anti, yeah, I'm guilty of that. <laughs> um, and I use elements of um, psycho psychotherapeutic um, um, uh, schools and, and, and all that. So, but I think it has been, good psychiatry has always been more integrative. Like good psychotherapy is. When you, when you, there are studies, I think, showing that when good psychotherapists and experienced psychotherapists are videotaped, and then people should, should say which school they are, they struggle. Yeah, you can't easily identify um, what, what school they are because they are all, all relatively similar. But that's not saying that it will, that it will go there. I mean, I'm, I'm basically, basically pessimistic, so don't, don't ask me about um, how, how things are going. But also, of course, because um, I've already seen the best services die. Um, I mean, if, if I compare that with, with, with 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years, is, I'm not that old, but uh, 30 years ago, I, I would say that overall, the deepest valleys of um, totally unacceptable, unacceptable treatment, they have been smoothened out. Yeah, you will find fewer scandals than you would have done 30 years ago. Absolutely. But the absolute summits of creative, um, committed, um, intelligent um, treatment have also gone. Yeah, so it is more, more a medium level of, of similar, similar behavior. I know that's not your question, but I can't really say where, where it will be. You, you will see where it will be going. <laughs> What has remained, perhaps, as a last comment, I was very intrigued by the power issues in research and in the medication and in the and in the practice, and these are there not only in the Western world but also in the low and middle income countries. The middle issue, the, the power issues are there too. And maybe we should start to. I was very. Uh, interested in trying to understand those dynamics and we need to start also researching that kind of those kind of processes and how things happen and why we need diagnosis because of medication or and not for example because of the person in front of us in certain uh, situations the time is up um, thank you very much for yeah. honoring us with your presence and your thought-provoking presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>